Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the 25th episode of VR Roundup. If you've missed a few days, the last few days being critical few days, and you're wondering what this VR podcast stuff you're seeing is all about, let me just lay it out for you quick. It doesn't replace the VR Roundup show. The VR Roundup is the news and current event show on the channel. And it's every Tuesday and Friday. That's not going to change. The podcast is exactly as it sounds. It is a very low editing requirements show. It will deal with some news and topical stuff on the days that I release it, which is generally going to be the days we're not doing the VR Roundup, time permitting, right? And... It's also going to cover just topical stuff, maybe a specific game, kind of whatever's on my mind. It'll be more of a radio slash podcast format. So with that said, guys, uh, lots of CES to talk about today, primarily a CES 2018 episode. There is one thing that I touched on in the podcast that I want to talk about in summary here, and that's Vorpex. I promised on one of the last VR roundups that I would get back to you guys and let you know what my thoughts are on this since I've never been that keen on VR Roundup in the past. Pretty negative, in fact. Well, that has absolutely changed. Happy to say with 17.3.0, guys, it lives up to the promise, finally, of one-touch, automated, quasi-VR functionality on games not built from the ground up to support VR. Perfect game that I use to compare, because the first question is going to be, how does it compare to actual VR? Let's use Skyrim as an example. Not as good as Skyrim VR. Close? No. Better than playing it without? Yes. It feels pretty good, and it's better than anything I freaking managed to dial in on my own scouring forum. So, lives up to that for sure. Tried Bioshock Infinite, Dishonored. Likewise, with those it now justifies, in my opinion, the $40 US price tag, mainly because it doesn't require that much tweaking. And what I didn't mention in the podcast, even though I talked about it for a while, was the cinema mode. That is fantastic now. Easily a rival for big screen, in my opinion. I like it better in Vorp X, if you want to play games that way. All right, let's jump into CES 2018. I want to start with some announcements well one specifically from valve and this is a really cool beta it is an input emulator for open vr one of the problems historically has been developers using open vr and we know who we're talking about certain developers for bs political reasons not extending functionality to other platforms even though open vr you know makes that a very much simplified process. One of the common issues is generally remapping of buttons not being supported and having compatibility issues that way. Well, that's exactly what this input emulator allows you to do. It allows you to remap buttons from the Vive to the Touch, vice versa, really even the mixed reality devices, anything technically supported by OpenVR. Beta runs till the 22nd of January. Then I would imagine they're going to go back to the drawing board, look at the feedback in the beta period, the testing, the complaints, the issues, rectify those, and then re-release. My guess would be sometime first quarter of this year. So, fantastic. Well, CES certainly not putting that uh, theory of what 2018 is going to be all about to rest. We're hearing a lot of wireless. So we're going to talk about that. In fact, I want to start with the TPCast unit first. So they're calling this TPCast Plus. And a little bit of an odd thing design-wise. What they've done is they've moved the battery pack to the head now. David Jagno, he's uh, one of the writers at Upload VR. We've talked about him many times. He tried all the devices, the wireless ones. He tried the Vive device. He, of course, tried this uh, plus TPCast Plus, and he's tried the regular TPCast. He says this is probably the least comfortable, and it's because of that battery mounting being up on the head. Spinning quickly, he said he could feel the battery wobble. What's more, before he started, the person that was the uh, booth attendee 
told him, you might want to wait a little bit. It's really hot. It's been on for several hours. Well, you know how I've complained, guys, in the summer, the humidity here really high, uh, fogs up constantly, unless I have the AC cranked and the air exchange system pushing humidity down. It's a non, non-winning battle. How much more with a glowing nuclear hot battery pack on the top of your head, heating your cranium even more. So yeah, not a huge fan what I'm hearing about that so far, but latency wise, some of the green graphical corruption that people have been seeing on the periphery, not there in the TPCast Plus. So that's fantastic. All right, let's take a look at the Vive stuff. So like I said, CES really covering a lot of wireless. HTC and Intel, they took to the stage to formally announce their Vive-specific Vive wireless adapter. And I talked about this before, and you might be wondering, okay, uh, didn't they have an agreement, Epics, with the folks at TPCast as well? Yes, they did. They're basically courting, uh, yeah, two different people for the same type of solution. This one, however, is much more formal. The other one was more informal, and it was more of a, a, a tech arrangement type partnership. This is an actual active partnership for the hardware specifically. This thing might look a little funny. Notice the little split antenna design on the top, but David Jagno, who also got an opportunity to try this, said it was uh, easily as good as the other units, uh, if not slightly better. Just a fantastic experience trying the device in room scale. So just to add guys, what I got a kick out of was you hear the attendee in the background. I don't remember if it was David trying this or somebody else, but he said, it's funny watching people put this on for the first time. Clearly people who haven't tried wireless VR and they all immediately center themselves at the middle of the room scale, which is just conditioning, right? We're trained to kind of do that with the damn tether locking us in to the PC or console. So that's definitely going to take some unlearning of muscle memory. And that kind of segues into the HTC Vive Pro. I touched on it. In fact, I did a little bit of an edit insert into the podcast uh, yesterday. Well, let's break this down. So this is the HTC Vive Pro. Love the way this thing looks. I really do. I think it's a sharp looking unit. The resolution, dual OLED 2880 by 1600. That's versus the 2160 by 1200 dual Samsung currently being used. Let's break that down into pixels. So we're talking 4,608,000 pixels on the Pro versus 2.5 million, 2.6 really, on the current HTC Vive. That's a 1.7 increase, I think specifically exactly at 78% increase in pixel density. Apparently, the screen door effect, which makes sense, a lot less prevalent. So if you were sensitive to that, this may be enough to have you not have to look and see that, notice that screen door effect each time. But there are still going to be people who have really sensitive vision up close that are still going to notice it. That's just going to be a continuous bar that you know, scales with resolution, it's going to get less and less until the majority of the population is no longer going to see a screen door effect. So a single button now to adjust IPD, inline amp for improved audio, the audio itself now resting on a head strap, similar to the $100 US Deluxe audio strap add-on, right, which was an aftermarket add-on, Dual cameras, and these are described by Daniel O'Brien, of course, a VP at HTC. He took to the stage. He said, we're opening the second camera up and giving developers a better experience than they had on the original Vive. And we're working with a lot of devs on different experiences they can use with two cameras, like having depth sensing with the second camera. A lot of the new features and functions are in progress, and we are excited about showing those things off very soon. How developers can take advantage of the second camera and do different types of maybe augmented reality experiences and trying different things. Note the stress I put on maybe. He doesn't seem to want to be committal to that statement. I don't blame him 
those things are up in the air and definitely being asked. Uh, he's probably been asked a million times, and I'm sure for the duration of CES, that's going to be his standard response. Now, there's still aliasing issues even at that resolution, which we know even 4K you can have aliasing issues, but uh, with anti-aliasing techniques, etc., expect that not to be a huge, huge issue at the 3K. I also just quickly want to talk about optimization. Not going to harp on this. I did that on the podcast, but um, this is an example where let's take Fallout 4. That was the one that I used in the podcast. And I said, this is a good example of when you don't have optimization, how that increase in resolution with nothing else giving can be detrimental. Those people who maybe didn't have a top of the line video card had a lot of reprojection with Fallout 4 VR are just going to get more now at the higher resolution because nothing else has changed. Now, like I also mentioned there, Fallout 4, of course, not optimized for virtual reality. It's a Bethesda engine powering this thing. So I suspect all of these things are going to evolve kind of in parallel, more or less, and uh, hopefully optimization is one thing we continue to see these companies push forward. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was this uh, shape-shifting tactical haptics controller from the company of the same name. They are a San Francisco-based company, and check this thing out. So they've uh, got a mating point, and that mating point forms a semi-rigid coupling between controllers that allows users to effortlessly maintain the mated poses. My question is, how heavy is this thing? How cumbersome if you're standing in room scale? My thought would be the objective is for these controllers to get lighter and lighter as technology improves. This thing kind of takes a step back when you look at it in terms of bulk and heft, especially when you consider you've got the Touch or the Vive 1 controllers you know, mated to this thing for some of that functionality. Now, they do have two games on display to highlight this device. The first one, Colony Defense. That has users join the controller to form a physics gun. So literally joining both of the controllers together into one unit. They can then be separated, one operating the jetpacking game, the other the weapon. Then they've got another game called Cyber Smash. That one specifically highlights the haptic functionality of this device. The company's saying that the design has focused on placing the mating sockets in optimal positions to aid reconfiguring them on the fly. So the design intent is surely to make this thing fast and easy to use. Again, I question how heavy, how cumbersome, you know, what does this thing feel like in actual practical use? And uh, hopefully I get to find out one day. All right, guys, that is it for the 25th episode of VR Roundup. want to thank you guys for your continued support. Uh, we will be back likely with a podcast or two, possibly before the Gaming Friday episode to uh, end off the week. Guys, as always, cheers.